All right, welcome uh, to session two of building your first Power App, or it might be your second Power App, third, I'm not sure, I don't know what your experience is, but if you've never built a Power App before, um, we are going to build one over the next month or two. Uh, the goal of these videos is to not be too long, not be too short, but just right in the middle to give you just enough information to digest uh, on a weekly basis. So if you are looking to build an app within the next week, uh, probably want to go and look for a different kind of tutorial somewhere out on the web. Uh, but if you've got the time and you're here just to kind of learn how things are going to work, then you're in the right spot. So the first thing is, let's take a look at what this app is actually going to look like um, in the end. And right now, I'm at the make.powerapps website. So if you did not watch session one of my uh, first video for building Power Apps, uh, the first video explains how to get an account to make a Power App, uh, to sign up for a community account, uh, explains on how to set up your data sources. So if you're definitely going to want to follow along and do this click for click and you haven't watched session one, go back and watch that now. And I'll put that link uh, in the comments section or underneath uh, the video title here on YouTube. So what this app is going to look like. And so this part, you just have to you know, just watch a little bit here and we're going to go with this one. And let me go to, uh, we're going to edit this one, but we're really not going to edit it. Just give you an idea of what's going to happen. <clears throat> and what this app is, is used for uh, is when I was working at a school before I changed over to being uh, a trainer for Power BI and Power Apps now, uh, is that we always had a problem of not being able to locate a student during the lunch if they decided to stay back in a teacher's classroom for tutoring or for volunteering. Um, and so what we, what I wish we would have had is, is an app like this that would have made things so much easier. And so I developed this once I started learning about how Power Apps worked and how I could make one. And the gist of this app is the first screen is going to have all of our students at our school. And from here, if I was the teacher, I could type in a name. I could search for the student who is staying in my classroom. I can click on the check mark next to their name. And what that is going to do is then take me to a new screen where I type in where they're going to be located, any extra comments, it's going to be tied to their student ID. And then I simply can submit it or I could click on a button that cancels it and says, oh, that was the wrong student or they decide to go to lunch, whatever the case might be. Once you submit it, it's then going to take you to a new screen where it's going to give you all the check ins ever for that exact student. Um, and so right now it, it looks crazy because it's not completely formatted because we're going to be making changes to these screens throughout the entire process. So what I'm showing you now might not be exactly how it's going to end up once we're done with all of our sessions. But the most important screen was for our front office. When a parent would come in and they needed to see where a student was at, they would go and click on, anytime they saw this button, see current location of any student. It would then allow our front office staff to search for the student, and then it would give the very last check-in of that student. So, for example, if they're looking for Rishi, uh, and it says check-in date of July 13th, well, if today is July 13th, then that's good. But if we're past July 13th, then we would know that Rishi is where he's supposed to be, which would be lunchtime. So that is kind of, and we got some more advanced screens over here, which we'll talk about later, but that is where the overall goal of our app making process is going to go. And of course, you might not be making a check-in app for what you are thinking about, but hopefully the skills, the formulas, the tools I show you throughout these processes will get you to where you need to go. So let's, before we start making the app, I want to go back one more time and take a look at our, our, our source info, so to speak, where we're keeping all of our data. Um, because even if you're not going to make the app with us, it's good to know what the data is and where it's housed. So we have one file. It's an Excel file that I have saved into my Microsoft OneDrive for Business. Okay, that's where it's saved. It's not saved on the desktop. So if you're following along, you have to save it in your OneDrive uh, business account that you have with your work or with your school. And all I did is I came up with a few different names, I think 10 names total, gave them random student IDs, gave them grade levels, I uh, gave them a, an email, and don't worry about this Power Apps ID because that is given uh, through Power Apps itself. So if you're going to follow along, come up with a few different students, give them some random IDs, a grade, and an email. The last thing that you have to do, uh, if you're familiar with Excel, you're going to have to format this as a table. But basically, you're just going to highlight everything that you want, click Format as Table, and turn it into a table. If it's not a table, this isn't going to work when we try to connect to it. So that is our first table. 
our first file, first Excel file. Our second one is going to be the actual check-ins. These are going to be created in the app itself. Um, so this is how many times I've done different check-ins as I've uh, demoed this for a few uh, friends and other teachers as well. And what will happen is when we check a student in, it will log their ID, their name automatically. And this, the location, comments, date and time and created by, that's all going to be input by you as the teacher or you as the user. And again, this Power Apps ID, do not worry about. It assigns it to them automatically every time we do a check-in. So that's what the two data sources look like. Now, I'm using Excel. If you want to use SharePoint, that's fine if you're more comfortable with that. Um, the coding might be a little bit different for certain things, but for the most part, I chose Excel because uh, even novice people to Power Apps usually have a little bit of Excel background. But there are over 280 places that you can actually store and connect to data in Power Apps. Uh, but I'm just trying to keep it as basic as possible here. So I just used uh, the Excel file. So I'm going to get rid of these now because if your Excel files are open when you're using the app, um, it won't actually write back and store your data for you. So that's just one thing to know if you're using the Excel file. So I'm going to get rid of these files and going to get rid of this because we're actually going to make a brand new app. So if you are on the home screen, so now I'm on the home screen. The very first thing that we're going to need to do is actually make a connection to our data source. So that way this Power App knows where it should be looking for the data itself. And the way you make connections is you come over into the left-hand window pane and under data. So normally it's not expanded. So we're going to expand data down and we're going to click on connections. Now because we are, these are all the connections I've used in the past, but if this is your very first time, also, before I forget, if this is your very first time and you created that community plan, but your work also has their own Power Apps tenant environment, what I would recommend is make sure you are in your environment. So like here, I don't want to be doing this in my Primatic Works production environment uh, because the people at Primatic Works do not need to have any access to this app. I don't want to uh, garble or jumble up the home screen of Primatic Works production. So I'm doing it right here in that community a license environment that we came up with in session one video. So I'm in Matt Peterson's environment and what we're going to do, let me exit out of there, is we're going to make a new connection. So your connection, new connection is up at the top and for this you might think that the new connection is Excel but your Excel file is actually stored in your OneDrive account so it's going to be a OneDrive connection. So you can Go through and search through all of these, like I said, and they're adding more and more connections every day. Um, so usually what I like to do instead of going through that whole process is in the upper right hand corner, you can search for your connection. So I'm going to search for OneDrive. I'm going to click uh, see what it comes up with. So it filters it down. And there it is, OneDrive for business. And all you're going to do at this point is you would click the create. I'm not going to create it because it's already there for me, but we would click on the OneDrive for business and we will be set up and ready to go. So notice that I'm not actually pointing to the files in OneDrive. This is just setting up the connections that any app I decide to build from here on out, if I decide to store the Excel files in my OneDrive, I will be able to connect to them at any given time and point. So let's build the app. We've done all the basic groundwork. Let's do it uh, in the building process. So I'm going to click on home and there's lots of apps that you can build. What we're going to be building, what this series is going to focus on is one of the most commonly used apps, which are your canvas apps. And we're going to do a canvas app from blank. So I'm at, I'm in the home, make your own app, canvas app from blank. And now we're going to give it an app name. This can be anything you want. And so what I'm going to call this is the Power Apps YouTube Sessions. All right. And from here, you can click on a tablet or phone. This is important to know. Once you decide tablet or phone, there is no changing it back. So if you, get, if you say tablet, you get halfway through creating your app, and then you're like, you know what? I wish this was really a phone. Unfortunately, you have to start from scratch. All right. So what we're going to do, I'm going to keep it tablet uh, because that is going to, you know what? No, let's keep this a, let's make this a phone app uh, because this is probably what our teachers are going to be using. Uh, they pull it up on their phone. You can obviously pull this up on your computer as well. The app works 
on the computer. Not it doesn't have to just be on your phone. But if they're away from their computer, most of the teachers don't have tablets at my former school. They, but everyone has a phone usually. So we're going to click on phone, and then we're going to click on create. And so right now, it's going to start us building into creating our first app. <clears throat> and as it is loading, it depends on your internet connection and how fast when it gets the things ready. And here we are. We are at the main screen. And so there's a lot of parts and components to the main screen, which we will uh we will highlight it different parts as needed. So I'm not going to give you a whole, here's what this does, here's what this does, etc. But as we need them, that's when I will describe what they do. So the first thing that I like to always do um, is actually make the, the data source connections. So right now we haven't connected to any data. I know we've made a connection back on our home screen, but for this app particular, we haven't said what data we're actually using. And so the way we're going to do that is over on the left-hand side, on the left-hand pane, far left-hand pane, you have this icon that looks like a database, uh, solo, so to speak. So we're going to click on the database, and it says, hey, there is no data in your app. So let's add some data to it. So I'm going to click on Add Data. And now this is where, if I click on Connectors, these are all the connectors I currently have used in the past. Um, and so I know mine is in the OneDrive for Business. Now, if you have not had any connectors so far, what you can do is in the selected data source and the search, start typing in OneDrive, and then this is in OneDrive for Business. That is the actual connection we made earlier. So I'm going to click OneDrive for Business, and it says, okay, this is the business account, which is mine. I'm going to click on it again, and it is now loading. And then over here on choose an Excel file, because I'm using an Excel file, that's what OneDrive connects to it. It connects to only Excel files into OneDrive. And so now I need to go and find out where I put those files. And I'm pretty sure I have those in my Power Apps and my Data Sources. This is just where I stored my Excel files. And that's where they are. Good, I remember. So check in student info. That table I definitely want to be part of it. So I'm going to connect to my student info, and I'm going to connect to another one. So I'm going to go back to Add Data, and this again is in my OneDrive for business. So just rinsing and repeating here, except I need to get the other um, file. So now I'm back into my Power Apps. This is where I stored it. Data Sources. Check in Student Location. And see again, so if you didn't have a, a, if you didn't format it as a table in your Excel file, you're not going to see anything here. That's why it has to be formatted as a table. So student location, click connect. It's going to make that connection. And that part's done. We haven't done anything building wise with the app, but we've actually connected to the data source. So the minute after I connect to a data source, the first thing I like to do is actually save the app. And you might think, well, haven't we saved it? Didn't we give the app a name? Well, we did not actually save the app. We just kind of got the, the setup, so to speak, started. So to save, it's going to be very familiar to what you've done in any Microsoft program. We're going to click on File. And when we do that, the first thing it's going to give us is this Settings pane. And the Settings is what we kind of already did. We gave it a name, which I called mine Power Apps YouTube Sessions. From here, when we go into seeing all of our apps on the home screen, each app has an associated color and icon with it, and that's where you pick this out at this time. So I like the, the aqua here, so I'm going to change this color to aqua. And this is a check-in app, so I guess it would make sense to use a check mark. And then here I can put a description if I want to. All right. If I go to screen size and orientation, again, I haven't saved anything yet. These are just all the settings. Um, I can change if I want the phone when they use this app to be in portrait mode or landscape mode. Uh, I'm going to keep it in portrait mode. And then you have all these other advanced settings under here, which later on I might go into more of those details, but I don't want to keep this video too long. Uh, we're just trying to get the basics down. Same thing for advanced settings. There's a lot to look in there. Uh, so if you're familiar with that, you can just do a quick search online to look through those or just read about them. It is pretty self-explanatory, but I won't, don't want to take too long harping on those. So I'm going to click on the save. So over on the left-hand side, I'm now clicking on save. 
This is going to be called Power Apps YouTube Sessions. Down on the right, which is sometimes I just find uh, students hard to find this, but the save button is actually on the bottom right hand corner. We're going to click save. And as it's saving it, <clears throat> what is happening is it's not publishing it, meaning um, I know we don't even have anything so far, but we, uh, well, sorry, <clears throat> after it saves it, it, it publishes what we, what we have. And if I click on see all versions, let me click on see all versions here. What Power Apps does, it has like a version, doesn't not like, not like has, it does. It has version control. So we're currently working on version one. So the minute I go back into the app, I make a change to it and I save it again, then I will have version two. So what's nice is you never overwrite the data technically because you always have all of your versions. So if I save this 40 separate times, I will have 40 different versions. And once I like the version I'm ready to use, I would click on the version that I want, and then it will allow me to publish that version if I want to. Um, or I could go back to the old version and publish as well. And we'll talk more about those uh, later on throughout the process too. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's go back to, so we can get rid of that, the see all versions, we don't need to see it anymore. And let's go back into the actual app itself. We've saved it, which is great. Um, and so now to get to the back to the original app, we have the back arrow, which is up here. So let's actually do some building. Over on the left hand side, this is called the tree view. We want to click on the tree view because what's going to happen over on the left hand side is everything that we're working with is going to show up in this pane. And right now, all we have is one thing, screen one. Um, and that's what we're currently looking at. And screen one is a great name, but I know what this how this app is going to work. So I'm going to change the name of screen one. This is where I'm going to be able to see all of my students. So this is kind of like the home screen or where I can browse for my students or search for students. So what I'm going to call this, I'm just going to do a double click. I'm going to keep it SCR. So that way I know it's still a screen. That way I don't have to rely on looking at and memorizing all the different icons for screens, headers, objects, images, etc. So I'm going to call this screen search students. You can name it whatever you want to, but based on how you name things, the coding that we're going to use throughout the process um, is going to be, the code is going to be based on what names you're giving things. So if you want your codes to match exactly like mine, screen search students is what we want. And I'm going to click on enter. All right. Now, <clears throat> the first thing we can do is with, when we have something selected, up above it, this is your property drop down. And when I, when I expand this down, these are all the things that we can change about the actual screen, just the screen itself. And what is usually used the most often and frequently is the fill color. So that's, let's change that first. The fill color currently, um, next to every property, you're always going to see your formula bar, or some people call this the code box. This is the current color that is the screen. It's the RGBA uh, code for it, <clears throat> which is red, green, blue, and then this last number is the transparency number. It can be anywhere from zero to one, um, with 100% being you can't see through it at all. It's going to give you exactly what it is. There's no transparency. So if we come up here to the fill color, <clears throat> so this is on the home ribbon, fill, I can now change this to a different color if I want. I could change it to this orange here. Uh, it's not pleasing to the eye, but that's one place where I can change the fill color, right here, just in the home uh, ribbon. Another place I can change the color is over on the far right hand side. This is called, oops, let me cancel that. This is called your uh, properties pane, the right hand properties pane, and we can change the fill to another color. So you have two different options, and you're going to see throughout these videos, there's lots of places to make changes. Now, we're going to go a little bit more advanced um, with this in a second. But for now, let's just, I'm going to pick a, a light gray for my background. So I don't want it to be white. Uh, so I like to use a light gray because we're going to use white colors for some other objects. So that way we see a contrast between the two. So I'm going to come up to here and just choose a light gray. and Pick any color of your choosing. I'll pick that light gray, maybe a little bit darker. Now I'll go back to this one. Okay, so that is currently 
my fill color. That is the background color. Um, now what I want to do is throughout this app, I want to use my school colors uh, for a lot of the text, for a lot of the background images, and etc. So one thing I want to show you, what I did is I went out and got some of the some of the icons that my school used for their their promoting their branding, um, and I needed to get those those codes for those exact colors. And well, where can I get those? I didn't know them. I didn't want to email anyone. I didn't even know if they knew what the exact RGBA codes were. So this is a website that we use quite a bit, that I use quite a bit. It's called imagecolorpicker.com. Uh, and I'm not getting any uh, advertising money or anything from this. This is just the one that I like to use. So the way that it works, let me get rid of this down here. The way that it works is you can upload an image and then pick on any part of that image of a color that you really enjoy, and it will give you the RGB code. The other thing it does is after you upload an image, it gives you a good palette of colors that they think are good ones to pick that complement each other very nicely. Now, what I did instead, instead of using one of their stock photos, I actually have a photo that I want to use. So I'm going to go to Upload Image, and if I believe, I have this saved uh, in my Images Icons button. And let's see, I'll just pick the Trojan head. So I'm going to open this up, and it's going to upload the image in just a second. And once it's done, what it's now going to do, I have this clip art that they use. I click anywhere on the green, anywhere on the black, the white, etc., whatever color, and it's going to give me the RGB code. So this is something that you can do if you want to start you know, playing with the colors that you want to use throughout this app. Pick, a, pick an image, upload it here, copy down these RGB codes, and, and you're good to go. So uh, I might not use these exact codes because I had some other pictures that I've uploaded here in the past, so I've already got some predefined ones. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use these hex codes to start making some color decisions. So I'm going to get rid of this website. Let's go back to our app. Now, because I know I'm going to use a certain color over and over and over, and it's not one of the pre-populated colors, and I don't want to have to go to custom every time and type in the numbers each time, I'm going to use our very first formula, which is setting variables. What this is going to allow me to do is call on this variable at any time. And it's kind of just like a placeholder. Just like in math, if I said x equals 8, and then five lines down, I say, what is 5 plus x? And we go, oh, x is 8, so 5 plus 8 is 13. So we are going to actually store these colors. And here's how we do that. You're going to come over here, and if we want variables to be stored to use throughout the entire app process, whether we're on screen 1 or screen 30, we have to store it at the app level, the highest level of organization, the entire app itself. And what we're going to do is with your on start property selected, so this is saying, hey, whenever you start your app, this is the variable that's going to be stored. We're going to write our first code. And here is our first code. We're going to go into the formula bar. And I'm in the formula bar here. And let me make this a little bit bigger for everybody. There we go. And our code is going to be set var. And as you start typing it, <clears throat> As we start, sorry, as we start typing it, we're going to have this IntelliSense start working for us. And these are all the different um, parts that we can use for, for formulas here. And so what we're going to do is just the set. And what, what are we going to set? We are going to set a variable name. So we're going to do set and then our parentheses. And now it's going to say, okay, what variable, what do you want to call the variable? This is your choosing. So this is going to be the main color I use throughout. So this is going to be the, the main green that I like that the school uses. So I'm going to name it. I like to use VAR for VAR. And that's why it said set VAR as the code. But it's not. It's just that when I name the variable, I always use VAR to start. So it's simply just set. Then I call it VAR. I'm going to call this VAR. Uh, let's go with JWJ because that is the initials for the school that this was created for. So var JWJ uh, main green. 
Okay. Um, and the reason I'm not using spaces is because if you use spaces, you actually have to type them in codes later on in the future. So I'm using what uh, is used quite often, which is camel casing here, where you capitalize the first letter of each new word. So that's the variable name. And now I need to give it an actual value. So the value is going to be an RGBA value. So we're going to go RGBA. So notice, once I start typing RG, it's saying these are the things that have RG in it that are codes that you can use. And if I hit the tab button, it's automatically going to put whatever is listed as first here. And that's exactly what I want. So I don't want to have to type all this. I don't like doing the clicking because then sometimes it clicks off. But people do different things. Um, so if this is the first one underneath, if I click tab, it puts it right there. So now this is the, the code that I have for my main that I had written down prior. So it's 17, 130, 17, 1. And again, and it sees, once it gets that color, it's going to show you a preview of that color right here. And that's the color that I want. Again, pick whatever color that you would like to use, but do store it as some kind of variable. Whatever variable name you give it, that's what you're going to reference as you write your code. If you want my code to match exactly with your code, you've got to name it var jwj main green. But I want to store one more color, kind of like that's a secondary color. And so to store another one, I need to run another set command. And in order to do that, I'm going to put a semicolon after this uh, code here. And now I'm going to hit shift enter. And what shift enter does is it now lets me move, it just moves me to a, a new line. You don't have to do the shift enter, it's just easier for me to see. I could have just done this as one long line, uh, but I like to do the shift enter just so it's a little bit easier to see. And we're gonna do the same process. We are going to set a variable. So we're gonna go set. I'm gonna call this var jwj secondary, all right? And then comma, so this is giving you your breadcrumbs. It's saying, okay, to use this code, First, declare a variable. Once you have the variable name, click comma. Now it says, okay, give it a value. And these are all the different values you can use. But since we're doing variables being stored as colors, we're gonna go with that RGBA. And the numbers for this one uh, are a 7, 180, 180, 8, and one, I believe. Let's see if that's the right color. Yep, that's a little bit of a, a higher, um, more brighter green. And those are the two colors that I want to store in this process. So if I click on enter, there's something I want to show you here. So as I click on, <clears throat> excuse me, as I click on enter here, up at the top right, we see this red dot show up. And this is called the app checker. And with the app checker, what happens is it's telling you there's something wrong with the, with the code that you have done. And so if we click on it, so now let me come back out. Let me zoom out here again. So let me click on the app checker here. And I'm going to put that box back up here. And it says, okay, you got some problem with your formulas, which I knew we were going to. And if we click on down, it says, you have some unexpected characters, unexpected characters. So if we click on it even more, it's going to say the formula contains paren close where end of is expected. All right. And then it gives you a little bit of a sample idea. So let's go take a look at that and see if we can debug it. So we at least know that it's something to do with parentheses. And this is what gets a lot of people. So if I look at my first line of code, I've got one, two, two left-hand open parentheses, but I only have one right-hand closed parentheses, which means we need to add another parentheses here. Now that looks happy, and if we take a look, see how it's highlighted here, and over on the left, that's its matching pair. So now we know that's good. So down here, we see this red little squiggly that means, hey, we're missing something here as well. And if I go like, oh yeah, look, that parentheses matches up with this one. There's no pair for that first one, so let's put a pair in there. And let's click on Enter, and now that should make it happy. And again, we no longer have an issue up here in the formula checker. Great. Okay, so um, if we go to, anytime you set a variable, you can now go and view the variable of what's being stored at it. So if I click on View, 
So I have view, so I went up to the home ribbon, clicked on view, and now let's click on variables. And it says, hey, we've got variables, but there's no value here. Wait, that doesn't make sense, right? So we set a variable, but we, we definitely gave it a value. So, well, why isn't there a value? Well, this is if because look where we put this code. We ran, we put this code for the property of the app of the on start property. Well, we haven't started the app yet. We're, we're still building it. We haven't actually opened it and said, let's start it and start using it. So you don't have to wait to actually publish this and run it in order for that to happen. What you do is to get those variables populated with the app selected right here. You're going to click on your three ellipses here, not the ellipses, the three dots that make up the ellipses. We're going to click on it, and now we're going to go, we're going to force it to do a run on start. So run on start. Let's see what happens now. Let's go back to view, back to our variables. And ah, there we go. We now have the colors stored or the RGBA code stored for our two different variables that we defined. And we will use more variables throughout these sessions, but these are the first two ones. This, these are the ones that are really used a lot to store colors anytime you have custom colors. Um, so I wanted to showcase that. All right, so now let's go back and take a look and let's, we, we've stored some variables, but we're still not seeing much yet of what has happened. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna get rid of these and I'm gonna get rid of that. There we go. We'll keep that app object up, the formula checker away. So I'm still in the tree view. Let's go back to the actual screen itself. So now I'm on the screen. All right, so I just selected the screen and the tree view. We need to add something. So one of the most important things is we want to put that, that title bar of what we're actually looking at. What's this app? What's its purpose, so to speak? So one way that I like to do this is I actually insert. We could insert what's technically just called a label, and it's just a, a label that you drag wherever you want and you, you make it do what you want it to do. You put whatever text you want in there. Um, but I like to make it a little bit more flashier. And so anytime I put headers in my apps, I go to the insert ribbon, I then go to icons. And also as I'm talking about this, if anytime I'm going to one of these, um, one of these actions under a ribbon and you don't see it, it could be because the resolution of your laptop screen is, is smaller. And so what you will have is at the very end, you'll have a drop down arrow. And if you click the drop down arrow, then you'll see all these extra things that you might not currently see on your screen. Uh, but mine all show up because I'm doing this on a TV screen as I'm recording. Uh, so I get to see everything, which is nice. But anyways, I'm back here to the insert ribbon. I'm going to go to icons. And uh, the icon that I like uh, to use is all the way at the bottom fairly close to the bottom, and it's the rectangle. So it's about seven eighths of the way down, and it's a rectangle. So I'm gonna put that in. And notice, it put a rectangle in for me. It's a blue color, which is fine for now. We're gonna change that. But this is gonna be my, my header. So now, if with this selected, I can move my anchor point, so to speak, around, and have it take up as much space as you want, but this is the header that we're going for. And notice that once I added something to the screen, over here on the left-hand side in the tree view, underneath my screen search students, it says, hey, you've got an object here. You put in uh, a rec you put in an icon, and it was called Rectangle. So they just rename it Rectangle 1, which is a fine name. But again, I like to rename things. Um, it takes a little bit longer to rename it, but then I think it's easier to reference as you start building this, because some screens could have up to 15, 16 objects on it. So I'm going to rename this. So I can do a right click rename. I did the double click last time. And I'm going to call this the rectangle. So RCT for rectangle. And then this is going to be my header, the rectangle header. I'm just going to click enter. Now let's do some stuff with this rectangle header. The blue I don't like because that's not my school color. So I want to change the fill color. Again, we could go to the far right hand side and change the fill color here, but we don't want to do that because we want to put in the, the variable name for this. So with the rectangle header selected, and you know it's selected because you see the points around it, I'm going to come up to the properties drop down, 
and from on select, I'm now going to go to the fill. What do I want this rectangle fill color to be? What color do we want filled in? So right now, this is the default color that Power Apps uses. Well, I don't want that. I want that main JWJ green. So I'm going to come in with the code, wipe it completely out. It is gone. So now it just defaults to black. And that main color green was stored as a variable. So if I just start typing in VAR, that's why I always like to put VAR in front of a variable so it lifts them all for me. And I want the main green, which is the first one there. So if I just click tab, main green, and look what we've got. We've now changed the color to the main green. I didn't have to go and look for it or type in the exact values because we've done that once and it's done for us for all time. Now this is great. We got some color, but we need some text in here. So in order to get some text, I'm going to go to insert and I can go to text. And this is going to be a text label. Now you might be going, well, what's the difference between a label and an input? Well, text input we're actually going to discuss in our next video when we talk about search bars. Uh, a label is just simply putting in text. So we're going to click on label and it puts it right here for us. And we can change this in just a little bit, which we're going to do now. So the first thing is it says label one over here on the left. And if that's fine for you, that works. If you want to rename label one, to something different. Um, so maybe I will name this LBL for a label and I'm gonna put, uh, it's the header label. It's a label header. Again, that is not something you have to do, it's just what I like to do. Now, with the label header selected, there's few few different ways that you can select what you're trying to change. You can do clicks. So if I click outside of the label, now I'm working with the rectangle header because it has changed. And if I click around the text, uh, see this is where sometimes it gets hard to get exactly what you want. Um, it, it took me four or five clicks for it to actually select the text box. So this is where I'm more of a tree guy. I come over and whatever I want to mess with or change, I just select it right here from the beginning, but to each their own. So the text, what do I want my text to be? Well, I want this to be called the JWJ check-in app. So I'm going to keep the double quotes because anytime you put in a, a string of, of characters, you have to keep them in the double quotes. And what I want to call this is the JWJ check-in app. I'm going to click enter. All right. Okay. Got the wording right, but now I want to do a little bit of modifications. So I probably want to center this. So to do most of your formatting, when you click on the home ribbon, this is going to give you most of your formatting options, as well as over on the right hand side, you have your formatting options as well. So the first thing I want to do is I want to center. So I'm going to come up here. We're going to click on center. Okay, that part's done. All right, now the next thing I want to do is I'm going to want to make that a bolder font. So I'm just going to go with bold. And finally, the black does not look that great on it. It's a little bit harder to read, so I'm going to change that to white. So I went bold, I went center, and I went white. But and it's centered here, but I'm gonna. This is still a little bit too small, I think. And and this is all formatting, and you decide what you want to do with it. But I'm gonna let's see if I change this to a 36. How big is that? 36 looks pretty good. So I'll keep it like that. For now, and we can come back and change this anytime we want to. Now we've made a few different things here. We've put in a uh, header at the top, we've put in some text. So I'm gonna hit Control S and it's gonna save it. Because there was changes from the original version to now, it says, okay, I can save what you've done. So, so far, so good. Now, the next thing that I want to do is you go, you know what? Maybe I don't like JWJ. Just to show you how easy it is to go back and change it, I'm going to come back in here. I clicked on label header, right? And I want to change the text, but right now it's saying the size. So how do I change the text? Well, we could, one, come over to the right-hand side and change it here. Or two, come to the property drop-down and click on text. You might be going, well, why do you do most of this through the property drop-down and not over on the right-hand side? Well, the left-hand property drop-down has all the things that you can do um, with it as opposed to over here on the right, not every single thing that you can do is listed on the right-hand side. 
Uh, it takes a little bit more of searching and looking for. Here it's just pretty up in your face. So I like to use it uh, from the property dropdown perspective. So the text, I'm going to change it. Instead of JWJ, I'm going to change it to Trojan because they're the Trojans. So we're going to call this the Trojan Check-In App. All right. So, so far we haven't done anything with data, right? Um, and we're getting close to the, to the end of this first session. So let's do our, let's actually put some data in here. So the way that we put in data, there's a few different ways. One is if we go to the insert and I click on data table. So insert data table. It's going to say, okay, you're going to want to put in data. Here's what you currently, here are the two pieces of data you currently have. Um, and if at this point we're like, oh, I forgot to make my, my data source connection. I didn't you know, tell it what to look at. This is where you could do it now as well. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to put in the student info. We want to just know the, the bare bone basics about the child. So if I click on student info, and then I'm going to skinny this down some. And right now we're going, wait, you just, you went to student info, but there's, there's nothing in here. Well, if we took, take a look, I'll zoom in. It says there are no fields in this data table. So we have a data table. We just haven't told it what fields we want to see. So if I come over to the right hand side next to fields, it tells me what my data source is. I'm going to click on edit fields. I'm going to click add field. And now I can put in what do I want to see? These are the four columns for each student. So let's say I want to see, look, make it look basically like that Excel file. So I want to see the name, the grade, the email, and the student ID. I want to see it all. So I click on add. See, this kind of looks just like the, the Excel file. And we could make some changes over here on the right, which we'll talk a little bit more later throughout. But it's not going to apply to us now because the thing with the data table is it is static. We can't do anything with it. We can't put any action buttons to create a check-in. This is just simply saying, hey, here's what the data looks like. Nothing else happens. So we don't usually insert data tables. I don't haven't used a you know, great use case scenario for things that I do of putting in data tables because my apps that I make are supposed to be interactive. So I'm going to get rid of this data table. Well, how do I do that? I have a few different options. Uh, one is I can come over to my screen, it says data table one, click my ellipses, and I can click on delete. And there, it is gone. Great, bye-bye. Now, but we still wanna see all those students, right? So how do we see all the students? Well, what we're gonna do is instead of inserting a data table, we're gonna insert a gallery. And again, if you do not see the insert gallery icon, make sure you go to the far right-hand side and click the down arrow, and that's probably where you will now get that option. So on that insert gallery, I'm going to click on, we have different option choices here, but for today, we're just going to go with the vertical option choice. So insert a vertical gallery, it says OK, so I'm just skinning this up right here, making it go down a little bit, and it says data source, and the data source I want, again, is student info. But just to show you that we could do it over here with the gallery selected, I could go from none and then drop down and say student info. Okay, so what it's done now is it's made a few recommendations of what we what they think we want the gallery to look like. Um, and this is not what I want it to look like at the end, so we're going to make some changes. But before I do that, since this is a gallery, I don't like the gallery name, so I'm going to call this the Gal Browse Students. Because in the end, I know that this gallery is going to be used for me to look for students and then click on them to create a check-in um, location for them. So that's why I'm calling it the Gal Browse Students. So with the gallery selected, let's just talk about well, why do they call it a gallery? Well, it's called a gallery because what they're doing is they're looking at this data table and they are basically producing a picture, so to speak, of each record in the actual file. So if we take a look, what we have is the three things that it's showing us right now for the first row of that data table that we started off with. It's reporting their email, it's reporting their grade level, and then it was trying to report some kind of image. 
but we didn't have any pictures of the students in the actual uh, data source. So this probably isn't, and this is what um, the gallery always defaults to, um, a title, a subtitle, and a picture or image. And if we take a look on the right-hand side, so I still have the gallery selected. On the right-hand side, this is the layout it picked, image, title, and subtitle. We don't want, I don't want it to look like that. So what I'm going to do is change this over. So I just clicked on the down arrow and let's go with, um, let's go with the image and the title. So let's see what that does. Image and the title. Well, again, image, I just said I don't want image, but this is just showing you, you can get a preview. It's going to give you a title and an image, which we don't have. So let's go with title and subtitle. Okay, looking a little bit better. So let's do some modifications to this. We are not stuck exactly with what they give us. So what we're going to do is, I this is definitely the, the email, but I don't want the email to actually show up because um, that's not going to be important for the person looking at the different students. So there's a few ways to do this. One is I can, with the gallery selected, I can come over to the fields and I click on edit, just like we did with that data table earlier. And right now it's saying, hey, title, I've chosen email to show up. So the email for each record is showing up. Well, I don't want the email. The most important thing is going to be the name. So I'm going to drop this down and click on the name. Okay. Now, and if we look, all the titles have now changed over to the name. Fantastic. The grade, okay, subtitle is the grade, which is perfect. I don't need to do any changes with, the, with that at this point. So it's looking pretty good, but I could change it if I wanted to go to grade, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to change it to email, all right, and so that's, that's one way. So I'm going to get rid of this. So let's say I've done all of my work, and then I go back, and I'm like, oh, you know what? I didn't want the email. Could I go and change this back to the grade? Sure, by doing what we did of selecting the gallery and going to edit fields. But now I'm going to show you the other way that we do this. The other way we do this is with some actual coding. So what I'm going to do, so I've got the gallery selected. And if you see up here, there is this pencil icon. If you click the pencil icon, what it does is it shows you into what we call row one of your gallery. This is the very first record from that Excel file. Anything, and we also call this the template of the gallery, anything that I change here will affect everything below. And I'll show you that just by moving this little uh, right-hand arrow. So I'm going to move this right-hand arrow all the way over here. And notice everything gets moved along with it because I'm in the template gallery. Notice that arrow though can only stay within the template itself. So I'm gonna put it, let's say I put it right here and then I'm gonna zoom out and you go, you know what? I want it back to exactly where it was, but I don't remember the exact location of it. Sometimes in the upper right hand side, you do have an undo button. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So let's see if it worked for that last one of me crazily drawing it and dragging it everywhere. And it did not work for that function. So I'm going to have to just try to put it back there because we're going to change this anyway, so it's not a big deal. So there we go. But let's get back to the issue at hand. Now notice, um, and, and that's the one thing with these videos, when making a Power App, nothing is linear. It's not like Power BI where there is step one, step two, step three, step four, and you pretty much got your solution. When building a Power App, there are lots of roads to take that all diverge or converge at the same process or the same solution. Um, so none of what we're doing, you do have to do in a certain step-by-step -step order. So let's say I don't have the template selected. So now I've just got the, do you see here, I'll, we have the anchor points around everything. So now if I try to move something, it's not moving individual pieces. It's only going to change the size of the gallery. So again, I could click on the pencil icon, or a lot of people just try to click in the first row. And so now we can see that I am in the first row because I've got those anchor points around there. Again, when you start having a lot on one screen, I'm a person that just goes simply to clicking on the gallery and then 
clicking the pencil icon. So now what I want to do is I didn't like this email. So what I'm going to do is click on the actual email part itself. Now notice, when I click on the email part itself, it says over here on the left, this is the subtitle. Oh, so I could have gotten to any of these pieces just by coming over to the left and saying, hey, I want to change the title. I want to change the subtitle. I want to change the next arrow. I want to change the separator, whatever it might be. So that's another way to do it without clicking gallery, edit the first template cell, and then clicking on what you want to do. So there's the different ways. All right, now let's take a look. We've got this selected. We have subtitle two selected. And in the property dropdown, it says text. And it says this item dot email. Well, what I want to do is I don't want the email. But what this item does is this is the code. What this is saying is saying, hey, for every row of your data, so for row one, I'm going to return the email address that is located for row one of your data source, which was Charlie. Charlie, don't remember, was the very first record in our data source. And then when it comes to here, it's going to do the same thing for Deja. She is the second row, so for the second row for this item, I'll return her email address, so on and so forth. So this item is really code word for the row of your data source. So for each row of your data source, return the email. Well, I don't want the email. I want their grade level. So I'm going to backspace out the email, and so now I have the this item dot. You always have to put a dot after this item. And anytime you're doing any coding throughout your Power Apps development and you don't quite know what to type in next for the code, always try dot and usually that will give you some options. And so look at the options that they're giving us. They're giving us email, grade, name, um, student ID, um, and this last part is selected which is part of a, a longer coding process, so we're not going to talk about that now. But we have four columns in this table and they're saying, well, what column do you want me to return for each row? Well, I want the actual grade for each row to be listed here. So this item dot grade, and look what we've got. We now have the actual grade levels of each uh, student. All right. Now, let's do a little bit more, and then we'll call it a day. We'll, we'll, we'll stop here, and we'll pick more up with the gallery on our next session and start adding some more screens. But the next thing that I, I do want to do is how does this person know that it's a grade? Um, you probably would figure it out, right? The front office staff is seeing six, sevens, and eights, and we're in middle school. But if we want to make it super explicit, we can actually hard code in something that will always show up that isn't part of the data source. It's just text that we want to be here. And so what we're going to do is with your grade selected, and so that was our subtitle two, we're going to go to text. We're going to add some text before it. I want them to know that this is their grade level. So since I'm putting in text characters, I need to wrap it in quotation marks. So in the quotations, I want it to say grade level. And then I want a colon. And then I want a space. And if we take a look, we're getting an X right away with this because this is where we're going to use another coding language uh, operator, which is our concatenate operator. What concatenate does is it smushes two things together um, in terms of what we want to display. So I want it to display this grade level, and I want it to be displayed with the data for this item.grade. So I'm going to put in an ampersand, and you don't need to have these spaces. They're allowed to be there. It's just easier to read the code. And so when I go to this item.grade, in front uh, or after grade level, what we see is when we click enter, we have grade level seven. So now all those numbers we had prior has now been hard coded with grade level in front. You could do the same thing with the, the student name. You could add in, um, you could put in, I'll do it real quick just to reinforce, but I'm not gonna keep it. If I wanted it to say student name before all that data, I click in, click in, I type student name, parentheses, so that I put those in my quotes because that is a text string, and I say, and I need the this item.name after it, and I click on it, 
and notice it now says student name Charlie W, Deja V, etc, etc. But again, I don't want that, so I'm going to just keep it as this item dot name. So, so far, we're going to do some more things with this gallery the next time we pick up. We're going to start talking about what these icons can do. But I think that is a pretty good intro um, to some of the coding. We talked about how to set a variable, talked about how to concatenate, how to make the uh, galleries dynamic by telling it what to return back from the data source. Um, so the last thing that we want to do is I'm going to hit Control S to save this. And if we wanted to see what it looks like, if you come up to the top right, there is a play button or preview. It's a play button, but it gives you a preview. So if I click on that, this is now what it's going to look like on somebody's phone once we publish it, or that's actually published already. So let's talk about that. And then I promise this will be the last thing that we do. If I come over, so I'm going to exit out of this. Another way to have previewed that is if you click F5 on your computer, it goes straight to it. And if you click F5 again, it closes it down. So again, let me do one last, I don't think I made any changes. I might have done a little one. So I'm going to save my app. I'm going to click on File. And now notice, I'm going to go to See All Versions. When I go down to See All Versions, you'll see how many times I saved it throughout our demonstration today. I saved it five separate times. But notice version one is the live one. So if someone was to actually click on this, or I shared this app and they clicked on it, they would not see what we just ended with. They would not see this app. They would have just seen, I think, just the gray background is it. Um, but we want them to see this. We like this version. So I click on version 5. I put next to version 5 over here. I'm going to select it. And once I do that, at the very top, now I have publish this version. I click publish this version. And now it takes usually about 30 seconds or so. If someone were to go to this app, because I shared it with them, they would actually see what we finished with. And then if we go, oh, wait, version 5, actually I've made a mistake. Version 4 is better. That's fine. You can go to version 4 and you can publish that. Um, and we'll talk about how to restore old versions uh, in order to do edits on them in the future as well. So I hope this was helpful today. I hope it wasn't too much. Uh, please comment below. Let me know what you thought, if there's anything you want me to change about it, any ideas that you have, whether it went too fast, too slow. Um, I would appreciate the feedback. All right. I hope you all have a, a wonderful um, Power App designing session in the future and that this went well for you.